Mr. Speaker, sir, we welcome the financial assistance that the DPM has announced in Budget 2023 to help Singaporeans cope with the rising cost of living and inflation. However, we are not sure whether more of the same short-term ad hoc financial assistance will strengthen the resilience of Singaporeans and help them move forward in a new era. The dozens of short-term handouts, like CDC vouchers, assurance paid out, cost of living special payment, public transport vouchers, and so on, are more likely to breed dependency. What is it? What is in it for me? But unlikely to strengthen resilience. We have said many times in this parliament that we need long-term programs to give Singaporeans comfort over their current and future financial positions before they can concentrate on becoming innovative workers and enterprising risk takers to build Singapore into a competitive information economy. We do not understand why the government is reluctant to implement long-term programs. Although, according to our estimates, Singapore has sufficient fiscal resources to fund these programs without drawing on the national reserves. The government likes to argue that alternative policy proposals will rape the reserves. But Singaporeans should note that this is a baseless allegation. Singaporeans should have guessed from the COVID-19 experience how large our reserves are and how strong our fiscal position is. If we do not have that, the government would not be able to commit to a $100 billion COVID response package, which is equal to more than 20% of Singapore's GDP in 2019. In the end, the government spent a total of $72 billion fighting COVID-19. But the interesting part is how the governments have funded it. The government did not need to draw $72 billion from the reserves, but only $40 billion because it was able to find $32 billion of excess fiscal resources in the budgets of 2020 to 2022 to fund the balance. On top of that, in the same three years, the government was able to set aside $24 billion from the budgets to top up various endowment and trust funds whose spending are for future years. Hence, we can say that there is a total of $56 billion, $32 billion plus $24 billion of excess resources in the budgets over the past three financial years. This translates into an annualized amount of about $18.7 billion a year. This amount is roughly equal to the net investment return contribution, NIRC, allocated to the budget each year. This is proof that the NIRC has always been a slack in the budget, which is normally not used to benefit Singaporeans in the year it was allocated. The government has argued that the NRIC is pooled with the rest of the budgetary resources and used for other purposes. But by setting aside a sum of money almost equal to the NRIC in trust funds and endowment funds, it is equivalent to not spending the NRIC in the current year. In fact, there may be more slack in the budget because we cannot understand why the total expenditure 
has stubbornly stuck at the $100 billion level in 2023. The total expenditure was only $75 billion in 2019, the year before the COVID-19 pandemic. It shot up to $100 billion from 2020, the presumably for fighting COVID-19. Hence, we have expected the expenditure to drop significantly in 2023 as we wind down the exceptional COVID-19 expenditures. We look forward to the DPM explaining with specific figures why the total expenditure has not come down. However, even ignoring the potential spending cuts, it is quite safe to say that we have excess fiscal resources each year, mainly from the NIRC, which can be deployed more proactively for the benefit of low-income and middle-income Singaporeans. In 2023, the NRIC has reached a new record of 23 $0.5 billion. PSP has always been confident that we have excess fiscal resources from the NRIC and other potential spending cuts. That is the reason why we have argued during the Budget 2022 that there is absolutely no necessity to increase the GST and other taxes to increase revenue. This year, PSP will present an alternative budget with long-term programs to give Singaporeans an idea how our budget can be restructured to better strengthen their financial security. First, the alternative budget will implement the Affordable Home Scheme and Millennia Apartment Scheme to reset the public housing policy. This is the single most important long-term structural program that will boost the financial security of Singaporeans. In Budget 2023, the government has increased CPF housing grant to help young Singaporeans buy resale flats. While we agree that young Singaporeans need help with affordable housing, the CPF grant may not be the best solution because it will further inflame the resale market. This will necessitate higher CPF grants in the next round, and the cycle will repeat itself. <coughs> in order to get out of this vicious cycle, we need a more fundamental solution, and PSP has proposed the Affordable Housing Scheme and the Millennia Apartment Scheme as one policy option. With the schemes, every Singaporean in each generation will enjoy an affordable HDB flat to start a family without sacrificing his retirement in the future. So we do not understand why the government said such schemes would negatively affect the future generation. To counter other narratives that the government is spreading, we would also like to reiterate that the schemes will not cause a sharp fall in resale prices because the demand and supply situation remain tight. And the affordable homes sellers will need to sell above current resale prices in order to earn a profit. On the other hand, Singaporeans who want to sell their flats after the minimum occupation period need not worry about paying a big clawback because the break-even price for a seller will be roughly the same whether under the current BTO scheme or the Affordable Home Scheme. The Affordable Home Scheme and Millennial Apartment Scheme will not draw down the reserves. Although land cost is waived for Singaporeans who live in HDB flats for their entire lives, most Singaporeans aspire to upgrade, and about half to two-thirds of the deferred land cost will be paid to the reserves eventually. 
In the alternative budget, we have budgeted $2 billion a year from the excess fiscal resources to reflect the upfront investment cost. Second, the alternative budget will promote the financial security of the middle-class Singaporeans as a priority. It is the decline of the middle class that has given rise to the two Singapores that the leader of opposition has described just now. While the middle class may not be a homogeneous group, it stretches roughly from the 20th percentile to the 80th percentile income brackets. And it's the group targeted by the government for spreading the tax burden over as wide a spectrum of the population as possible. In contrast, the top 10% income bracket is doing well because Singapore's tax regime favours them, and the bottom 20% do not pay taxes. It is not wrong as a fiscal principle to spread the tax burden as widely as possible. However, middle-class Singaporeans are already overtaxed relative to their, to their income. Personal income may be low, but there's a whole range of indirect taxes they pay. The GST, high housing prices, stamp duties, middle shield and cash shield premiums, COE, ERP, ARF, domestic helper levy, and so on. During Budget 2022, besides the GST, we have spoken out against the property tax increase, which affected the middle-class Singaporeans. This year, the stamp duty and ARF increases will affect them again. In the alternative budget, PSP proposes that some of the tax increases of Budget 2022 and 2023 should be reversed. GST will be reverted to 7%. And property taxes for owner-occupied properties will be restricted to those with annual value of more than $50,000. The same duty increased will be limited to properties that are worth more than $3 million, and the ARF increase will be limited to cars with OMV of more than $60,000. PSP believes if tax increases are really necessary, they should be targeted at the wealthy individuals and corporates. PSP would also budget $4 billion for the nationalization of the MediShield and CareShield schemes, which we first recommended during Budget 2021. This will relieve especially middle-class and senior Singaporeans of the anxiety over ever-rising health care insurance premiums. After the HDB flat, health care expense is the largest drain on the CPF savings of Singaporeans. While we should maintain the MediSafe account for Singaporeans, for Singaporeans to share in the health care expenses to prevent overconsumption, the existence of multiple health care insurance schemes has added unnecessary cost and complications to the health care system. By taking over the whole health care insurance, we hope the government will be in a better position, better position to develop an optimal health care system together with the new Healthier SG initiative. Third, PSP is very concerned about the job security and job prospect of Singaporeans. The government should always be mindful that Singaporeans are disadvantaged when competing with employment pass holders, EPs, who are exempted from CPF contributions. While we welcome the move to increase the contribution cap to $8,000 to boost retirement adequacy, it will exacerbate the disadvantaged position 
of the Singaporean PMEs relative to the EPs. In the alternative budget, to level the playing field between the Singaporean and foreign employees, PSP will introduce a $1,200 monthly levy on EPs, which we have recommended since 2021. This EP levy is estimated to generate additional revenue of two to three billion dollars, which will add to our, our excess fiscal resources. In Budget 2023, there is one positive change in the government's approach, which is the Jobs Skills Integration Program. Finally, the government realizes that funding of skills training should be tied to specific job prospect. We have always been skeptical about the nearly $1 billion of annual spending on skills future and all the other spending on retraining and placements of Singaporeans who have lost their jobs. Because it is unrealistic to expect all Singaporeans who have, who have been displaced by foreign PMETs to acquire totally new skills and join new sectors. We should have focused our spending on training Singaporeans to acquire skills that help them to hold on to their existing jobs or find jobs in fields with similar required core competencies. A good manpower policy is one that will not allow the displacement of Singaporeans from the job market. Fourth, PSP will increase the amount of compassionate spending for low-skilled workers and disadvantaged segments of our society. PSP proposes budgeting $3 billion for a living wage, which guarantees a minimum monthly take-home pay of $1,800 for all Singaporean workers. We have recommended this during Budget 2021. The living wage will allow all Singaporean workers to attain the minimum standard of living. The progressive wage model can remain, but for helping workers to achieve a higher wage level than the living wage. Next, PSP proposes budgeting $1 billion to help the disadvantaged segments of our society by doubling the ComCare payout for the poor, and providing an, an allowance for caregivers and stay-at-home parents in recognition of their sacrifices and contribution to society. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, sir, in the occasional paper on the medium-term fiscal projections, the government has painted a scenario of looming current and future budget deficits. But PSP has pointed out that, in fact, there are excess fiscal resources in the budget that can be deployed better. And this is before further potential savings that we can have from spending cuts partly due to the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. PSP has proposed an alternative budget to demonstrate how the budget can be restructured to deploy these resources. For a start, we have increased net spending by about $8 billion, a fraction of the excess resources we have, to implement long-term programs that will, one, proactively deploy excess fiscal resources in the budget for the benefit of the current generation of Singaporeans. Two, promote the financial security of the middle class, who are the bedrock of the society, as a priority. Three, reduce social economic ills caused by high property prices by resetting our public housing policy and eventually wean off Singapore's overdependence on property as an engine of economic growth. I invite Singaporeans 
to be the judge of the merits of the proposals in the alternative budget. Singaporeans deserve better for country, for people. Thank you. Janet Ang.